Hi, welcome to the signal path. In the previous video, I repaired an Agilent wavelength multimeter, which is this platform where you can plug in various modules for different optical functions. And one of those modules was a dual Fabry Perot laser in the 1330 and 1550 nanometer range. And in passing, I mentioned that you could calibrate these and tune those lasers. And a couple of people asked me, well, how do you even tune these semiconductor lasers and what can you do with them? So I thought that's actually a pretty complicated question because there's a lot of different ways of tuning these semiconductor lasers. And thanks to my Patreon supporters, I went ahead and I purchased one of these tunable semiconductor lasers so we can investigate it. This is a TSL 200 by Sandic. It's fully broken, of course, it doesn't work. They're quite expensive when they're functional, even though this is a fairly old unit. Now it has a lot of different functionalities. We can talk about it uh, and hopefully when we can repair it. It shows the wavelength as well as the output power right over these two displays. It also has the optical output here behind the shutter. You have to open it to attach the PC connector to it. And the reason is that this is a class 3B laser. So you don't want this to be open in case there is no fiber connected and then somebody enables the laser output. And then of course that's dangerous for your eyes. So right now it's plugged in and pressing that power button does absolutely nothing to this. So we're gonna have to figure out how it works. And hopefully when we can fix it, if we can fix it, then we can dive into tunable semiconductor lasers in general. And I can talk about a whole bunch of different ways that this is uh, tunable indeed. And talk about even how spectrum analysis is done in the optical domain. We can take apart a couple of other instruments in the in the process and learn a lot about it. So let's get started. All right, let's take a look inside of this unit. So we're taking the screws off and we should be able to peel this label off. And there we go. And there it is, looking quite nice. Let's see what's going on here in different sections. Wow, there's a, some really crazy bodge job done over here. You have to take a look at that closely. So by just looking at it briefly, we can see power supply section over here. The line voltage selector is down there. We've got some control over here, which is clearly for the tunable laser module, which is fully enclosed and embedded in this. If you look at this spacer, this is quite soft and squishy, and this is probably for thermal as well as for vibration, so that it doesn't, you know, so this thing actually has some freedom to move inside of here, perhaps some shock absorbing qualities of it, and all these uh, cables coming out controlling the laser. This almost looks a bit like a prototype. It doesn't seem completely finished, and I think there are newer models of this that are probably more refined. So let's focus on the fact that it doesn't turn on at all. So if you look at the back, we have two power supplies, and I think they look actually identical, which is interesting, and then a whole bunch of other uh, DC-DC conversion potentially, or maybe not even DC-DC conversion, no, this looks like some basic power supply stuff, and underneath it I can see through this angle that there's a transformer there as well. And here's a close look at this bodge here, and there's indeed a potentiometer at the top that can be adjusted, so this is something that they must have had to do afterwards to get this thing to you know, eventually meet some specification they were looking for. Everything is silicon down, I guess it works, and they probably didn't make enough of these initially at least to justify making a whole new board for it. So taking a close look at this, it reveals that the power supply is broken into two sections. One section is based on a transformer which is underneath this board, creates a plus and minus power supply, perhaps for some quiet part of the design where you need very low ripple. And on the other side, we have two identical DC-DC converters on top, switching power supplies on top of each other. And this is probably for parts of the circuit that maybe need more current, but do not require a very quiet supply, maybe heaters and things like that. So they both broke together. And I think that the digital part is almost certainly running from these power supplies. So this is a good place to start. Okay, first thing first, do we even have line voltage coming onto this? Because there's a complicated line voltage selection there. There we go. And let me turn it on. What do we have here? 126 volts. Okay, so we definitely have line voltage coming in. So that answers that part. That's easy. Turn the line voltage off. Then we go back to DC voltage. Do we have DC voltage coming out of this DC DC power supply or not? Powering it on. And nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, so that already explains what the problem is. There's absolutely nothing being produced by this power supply. So we're going to have to take it out and take a look at it. So I went ahead and took both of the power supplies out. The good news is that they're identical, and the bad news is that they're broken in exactly the same way, which is quite unusual, and they both of them produce absolutely no outputs whatsoever. And these are model LDA30F-5. These are 5 volt, 6 amp uh, switching power supplies. And because they're fully isolated at the output, you can share the ground between them and then create plus and minus 5 volt power supply. And that's indeed what they're doing in that instrument. And they just both receive the line in and a simple single supply output. Now, there are a lot of the CDC converter videos on YouTube. I've done a few myself. So we're going to do kind of a speed through through this. And hopefully we can repair it fairly quickly. So this entire switching power supply is based on a Mitsubishi switching regular controller IC. 
And if you look at the data sheet for that IC, you can see an application diagram for a typical feed-forward architecture. And this is essentially almost identical to what is inside of this particular switching power supply with some minor changes here and there. But if you look at this architecture, you can see that the AC line coming over here through a bridge rectifier is across a capacitor. That's almost always what's going on at the beginning of any switching power supply. And there's some protection circuitry and some common with inductors for noise, supp noise suppression as well. That's not really shown over here. But the primary function is always the same. This switching regulator switches a MOS transistor of some kind, which then turns current in and out of some transformer, which then produces a voltage on the secondary side of the transformer. And some feedback path is there to control the pulse width modulation effect of this switching regulator to give you the voltage that you want. And there is some regulation on the output of the transformers as well. And if you look over here, we have opto isolators, which are these opto isolators over here, in order to bring and regulate this whole thing. We have a voltage reference here as well. Now, the main challenge for these switching power supplies is every single part of this can break the whole thing because everything is in a feedback. But you should always start from checking the power supply of the switching regulator first because if there is no power supply, the entire system cannot start. The power supply for the regulator for the switching IC actually is derived from one of the transformer secondary ports. But of course, if there is no activity, there is no power supply. So what they do is that they usually provide a small leakage path and charge a small capacitor, which then turns this IC on. And once this is on, that's the startup condition, then it goes into regulation and then the whole thing works. We can see that the capacitor over here is the capacitor that charges up initially in order to maintain this guy to power on. So we have to look for that capacitor over here. I think that's this one right over here. So we should be able to take a look at it. But in order just to make sure, we're gonna put this in an oscilloscope and try and see if there is any activity. And there are some things you have to be very careful about. So let's go ahead and use the DSOX from Keysight here to make this measurement. Now just keep in mind that either the oscilloscope or the power supply have to be on an isolation transformer. Otherwise, you're going to be earth referenced and the BNC cables on these oscilloscopes are in fact earth referenced. So if you connect the negative terminal of your probe potentially on somewhere over here that has some voltage present on it, like on the positive side of the capacitor, for example, you will destroy the oscilloscope, the probe or, or the power supply itself. So you have to be very, very cautious. I've already done that, obviously, all my circuits are being tested on an isolation transformer. In fact, on the GW Instec APS1102, which I repaired in a different video. Okay, let's go ahead and try to take a look at the power supply of this particular circuit over here. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And there it is, check it out. So we're triggering nicely on there. So there, there is a DC voltage of about 15 volt that's present. That's normal, you expect that. But then you see these spikes on it. So these spikes are when the power supply is trying to start up. So what happens is that the, the whole regulator, the switching power supply controller, begins to try to turn on the MOSFET. Now there's an inrush of current as it begins the activity to turn on. That inrush of current is supposed to be provided by the capacitor that's sitting on the power supply of the DC-DC converter. But if the capacitor is not working, then there's no charge left in it. So then the power supply collapses in a spike as soon as the system begins to start and then the whole cycle repeats because it detects a drop in the power supply, the DC-DC converter resets and then charges back up again and it tries again and again and again. So this almost for sure has to do with that capacitor. It's most likely not working, therefore it constantly resets itself. Let's take it out and try it out. Okay, I took out both of these capacitors from both of the power supplies and interestingly enough, they're 250 volt rated, which is very unusual because at 250 volt, that entire IC would be dead anyway. So these are a bit of an overkill. We can definitely replace them with something like 50 volts and there should be no problem. But first we have to measure an LCR meter to make sure that's really the issue. And we may go all out and use the Keysight E4988 to measure these capacitors. Why not? And here's the first one. Going to connect it over here and let's see what do we get. We have a capacitor of 892 nanofarad and a series resistance of almost 800 ohms. This capacitor is terrible. Okay, let's measure the second one from the other power supply. And what do we have here? Oh my God, this one is even worse, 1.2 kilo ohms. So yeah, these capacitors are completely dried out and they're providing absolutely no protection for the power supply on that particular switching regulator IC. So we're gonna change them now. Okay, the power supplies are back. Here's a moment of truth and, ah, there we go, not bad. Okay, let's see what it's gonna do. It's gonna have to run through some initial startup conditions, I think, before it's going to stabilize. It may take a little bit of time. Uh, it's kind of freaking out. I think that's normal. 
Okay, so we have the temperature light on here, and that's normal. That's part of the system. I think it takes a little bit of time before that temperature light goes away once, once it stabilizes, and it has to do with how it tunes the laser. So let's go ahead and measure this once it stops and make sure it's actually working, and then I want to dive into all the different ways wavelengths can be measured and lasers can be tuned. Okay, let's try this out. I have the output of the tunable laser directly connected to the HP86120B, which is our multi-wavelength meter. Right now, there is nothing coming out, so we're seeing nothing, of course. I'm going to turn APC on. APC is automatic power control that allows this system to automatically adjust the output power using a local loopback. And the laser diode is off right now, so we're seeing nothing. Wavelength is 1520. Let's go ahead and turn the laser diode on. Let's see what it does. Okay, it's changing. Zero. Let me see. There you go. Look at that. That's pretty good. 1520.24 nanometer. Power is 0.21 dBm, very close to what it's supposed to be. The wavelength accuracy is quite good. Again, this thing hasn't been calibrated in a very, very long time. It's off by about 242 picometers uh, in terms of the wavelength. Let's change the wavelength a little bit. Let's go from 1520 to something higher. Let's go to 1521. There we go. Very good. It, it changed almost exactly by one nanometer. So I'm quite happy about it. It works. But how does it work? I think we need to figure out a couple of different things and build upon knowledge to figure out exactly how this thing does it because it's quite sophisticated. So let's show you a whole bunch of things along the way. So let's start from here. This is a laser diode module in a gold box. These are very common in optical communication systems. This particular one is intended for dense WDM applications and sonnet and other kind of optical long reach applications. Now, as soon as you're in a WDM, which is a wavelength division multiplexing system, you're going to have to really worry about the wavelength you're putting out of your laser. Because if you drift away, you're going to interfere with the other WDM wavelengths in the grid. Now, typically, these grids are in the 100 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz range. Now, 50 gigahertz sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot when your carrier, which is your laser wavelength, is in the hundreds of terahertz. So you really have to stabilize that laser in order to be able to make that happen. Now, depending on whether your grid is 50 or 100, the technology inside the gold box has to change because there's a difference in wavelength stability that is required. So what's in one of these and why is it so hard to stabilize the laser? I think it will get the point across if we turn this on without any of its stabilizing functions and see how much the laser drifts due to things like temperature. Okay, so let's measure the wavelength stability of this module right over here. It's being powered with a constant current source instrument over there, so we should be able to monitor the wavelength, and then we can change the temperature and see what happens. So let's go ahead and turn the laser on. And I already changed the units so that you can see it in terahertz. There you go, 194.0335 terahertz is the frequency of this signal coming out. This is about a 15, 40 nanometer or so. So you can already see that the wavelength is moving around. That last digit you're looking at is hundreds of megahertz. So let's go ahead and cool it. I'm going to spray some cold air on it. See what happens. Let's wait a little bit. Look at that. And so it's already shifted by tens of gigahertz. You can see already almost 50 gigahertz, and soon it's going to probably hit 100 gigahertz. So 100 gigahertz shift just basically puts you in an entirely new band, and it's still going, of course, because the, the thermal mass of this thing is large, and it's now equalizing in temperature overall. So you can see how much shift we experienced by me just spraying a little bit of cold air on it. This means that this is completely unacceptable in any realistic way in any system that's in a WDM configuration in particular, not to mention that the sensitivity of photodetectors in a communication system also changes across wavelength, of course. So how do they fix this in this module? I mean, this thing is so small. So what's inside of it? So here's what's roughly inside one of these gold boxes. Now, it's really amazing to see the free space optical packaging and integrated optical packaging technology that goes into these. And optical packaging has kind of had its own Moore's law in the past 10 or 20 years, continuously improving both in size, in functionality, and reduction in cost, which is very important because these things really, really need to be inexpensive as there are millions of them that need to be produced for various types of optical links. Now, in the heart of this, we have, of course, our laser diode. In this case, this is a DFB laser, and around it, there are some bias D and some resistors and so on to help provide the accurate biasing to it. So you need to push some DC current through the laser diode to turn it on. But this particular one also has a port for some modulation. So you can modulate the laser as well. And that's the whole idea of using, of course, optical links. The modulator doesn't necessarily need to be done this way. This is most likely for some kind of synchronization. So now that we have this, well, we can bias it very precisely, but we know that this temperature is really important. 
So you need to measure its temperature to know exactly where it is, and for that there is a thermistor. This thermistor is thermally coupled very well to the laser diode, so it's right at the heart of the temperature of the laser diode you can measure directly in a low thermal mass environment. But that's not good enough, of course, you need to adjust the temperature of the laser diode. And for that there is a thermoelectric cooler here. Now these thermoelectric coolers, these are Peltier coolers, they're essentially thermal pumps, so you can move energy around using them thermal energy. Depending on the direction of the current you push through the thermoelectric pump, you can move it in one direction or another. It means that you can use the tech to go above or below ambient. The techs are not efficient at all, but this is very, very, very small and is used to just adjust the temperature of the laser diode and nothing else, which is quite nice. So by using the tech, the thermistor, and the laser diode and the biasing circuitry around it, you can precisely control the bias of the laser diode and its temperature. Well, now may you say, well, that's good enough then. Why don't we just do a lookup table? Basically measure the laser diode across all temperature, measure its wavelength, and create a lookup table where whenever we want a certain wavelength, we just adjust the temperature to, that, to the value we want. And that actually is not a bad idea, and it would work in a lot of scenarios where you don't need precise wavelength. But of course this changes with aging and many, many other factors. So that's not good enough for the type of applications we're looking for, not good enough for WDM, and certainly not good enough to put yourself on a 50 gigahertz grid. So you need something else on top of that. So the other thing they do is that there is a photo detector here, which measures the power of the laser diode. By coupling some light to it, you can find out how much power, how much optical power the laser diode is producing, you can use that information to adjust the current through the laser diode. So you don't put too much current, for example, through it, or if there is not enough, you make sure you meet a certain optical power requirement. But there are also two different photo detectors here, and these are labeled PD wave, so these are obviously for wavelength measurement. But how does that work? That's really the magic inside of this, the, the really amazing part of closing the wavelength loop. So let's go down a little bit further to the block diagram of this and see what's inside of it. So we can already identify the components we were looking at. Here's our DFB laser. It's sitting on this silicon submount, which is coupled to the thermoelectric cooler. And next to the thermoelectric cooler, we have the thermistor, which measures the temperature, of course, and this entire three piece are very, very small and allow it to control the temperature. The output of that is coupled to a lens and it goes out of the pigtail of this whole module. It comes out of the fiber, as you saw. There's also an isolator here, which is on super interesting thing. This prevents light from coming back into the module and because this is coherent light you can get fringing and you can get interference patterns so you don't want that and that prevents the reflections from building up inside the module. Now if you look on the left side you can see that the some of the power of the DFP laser is coupling onto this photo detector. That's the photo detector that measures the power, how much optical power is there. There's also this thing called the dual etalon. So an etalon is actually an interferometer. It's based on a Fabry Perot interferometer. Etalon is a French word, means standard. So by using a Fabry Perot interferometer structure, you can create a fringing pattern or an interference pattern depending on the wavelength of the light leaving. So basically what this does, it translates wavelength to intensity. If the, two, if the wavelength you're interested in is producing a constructive interference, it's going to produce a lot of light on the photodetector. So the photodetector generates a strong signal. But if the interference is destructive, there is no light on the photodetector and therefore the output goes away. So you can measure the wavelength by translating it to intensity. It's really quite amazing. It's a self-interference thing. So here's a diagram of roughly how that looks like. This is just one example, which is the easiest one to understand. And these type of interferometers are typically made of two mirrors. So when the light enters, it produces many, many reflections between the two mirrors. You can control the distance between these two mirrors precisely and mathematically calculate how the light, because it's a coherent light, how does it self-interfere to produce these light and dark areas due to these fringing patterns. And you can measure that with a detector and that falls actually on a grid, depending on the distance on these two mirrors. So that's how you can jump between, let's say, a particular grid size, 50 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz, and then you can use the temperature to tune the laser to land in one of those areas, one of those interference patterns. So it's genius. It allows you to therefore select the wavelength you want by using this ethylon interferometer business. Very, very cool stuff. So then once you do that, you can then shine this into, this is a dual ethylon, you don't need a dual one, of course, depends on what you're doing, but then you measure the signal on these photodetectors. So these three signals come into this little microprocessor area, and what comes out at the end is a voltage that's proportional to wavelength using the interferometer, 
a, a voltage that's proportional to the optical power using the coupled power into the photodetector, and of course a voltage proportional to the temperature using the thermistor. That's it. And with those three values, you can create sophisticated closed loop systems to adjust and stabilize all aspects of the laser and get the grid value that you want so you don't interfere with the other WDM signals in the optical link. Really quite amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and open the module that I have. Now I'm not sure if that one has an ethylene interferometer inside of it, because sometimes you don't need this and by removing it you relax the wavelength requirements of the module, but then you can't use it in a small grid. But nonetheless, we're going to open the one that I have, we're going to sacrifice it so we can take a look at it, I'll try to remove the lid. And then we're going to jump into actually talking about instrumentation, because that's a whole other problem. This is just for creating something in the communication network. All right, so I managed to get the lid off without damaging it. And if this is not the coolest thing you've seen today, let me know in the comment section what you've seen that's cooler than this. So here's inside our DFB laser, and we should be able to now identify all the components that we talked about earlier. So first look from where the laser actually leaves the module. So under, over here, you can see there's our pigtail fiber. There's our fiber right there. And of course, our pins at the top and the bottom are visible. If I center this one more time, we can go over this piece by piece. So in the very, very right side over here, we have our collimating lens. That's how the light is coupled into the fiber itself. It collects them and puts them in the center of the fiber. This is single mode fiber. There's very, very narrow diameter in the center. And right after it, we have this thing, which is our isolator. Now, if you note, everything here is on the same silicon subpanel. And if you don't do that, as things thermally change, they're gonna drift away from each other. And this is one of the hardest part of any optical packaging, is to keep everything moving together. You have to be accurate here in the nanometer range because you're dealing with coherent light and misalignments basically is the end of the module. So sometimes they even align these with laser punches. And sometimes, let me see if this one has it. Yeah, I think it does. Now, this, I'm not sure if this is the case for this particular module or not, but this dot you see here is sometimes done by, sh by hitting this with a laser pulse in order to align it just right because you want to move it so little. I think that's what that dot is there for this particular module. So our isolator here of course provides the return isolation from one direction so the light only goes in one way and not the other. Here's another lens, a focusing lens for the actual DFB laser and those tiny semiconductors you see in the middle are actually our DFB laser itself. And the top right, here's our thermal resistor, it's our thermistor, it goes into two of the pins in the top right, you can see everyone, everything is wire bonded over here, and here's our lens over here, and there are prisms, if you look, if I move this around, you can see those prims, prisms on that integrated optic piece, and that splits the signal, the laser, from the back side into two parts, so those two parts come out, one goes in this angle, one goes in this angle, and they, once they hit this lens, they go straight, so comes angle straight one way, angle straight another way, so we expect to find our ethylon structure on the back over there. And if I tilt it, there's our ethylon structure right there. There it is, on the left side, or the bottom side, I should say. And on the other side, we have two photodetectors. There they are. So one photodetector at the top, this one, this measures intensity, and this measures our fringe pattern, which is basically the interference pattern, so that we can tell what the wavelength is. There you go, all of that is there, and at the very bottom, there is that connection to our thermoelectric cooler. You can see how many wire bonds come out of that. That's because this thing carries the most amount of current in order to be able to do its job. Yeah, so that's the entire sandwich. Look how beautiful this is. This is all done now this pretty much automatically, but it's a really a, a thing of beauty. And all the biasing structure for the DFP laser, you can see here in the middle. And that's almost one-to-one -one with the block diagram that we saw. This one doesn't have a dual ethylon, it only has a single one but it does everything we want to. It puts you now on, an, on a 50 gigahertz grid. I think this one particularly, it has eight 50 gigahertz grid tunability capability, which is pretty amazing. Now this is all nice and great, but this is not instrumentation level. When you want to build an instrument, you're going to have to do a lot better than this because you need to precisely measure the wavelength and be able to tell the user what that wavelength is across a wide, wide range of frequencies. So let's dive a little bit into that and see how instruments achieve this. So let's talk about grading mirrors or diffraction mirrors. I've talked about these on the channel before, and these are repetitive geometric structures that allow the light to interfere with itself, creating destructive and constructive patterns. But because the spacing between these grading lines is fixed, depending on the wavelength, the angle in which they interfere is going to be different. Therefore, it's going to split among many different angles depending on the wavelength coming in. 
This is basically a Fourier transform in optics. So a composite light coming in is going to land on a different location depending on its wavelength once it's reflected off of this surface, which is exactly what a Fourier transform is. So if I look at it in a ceiling light here, we find one. Here we go. You can see the white LED being split to all the different wavelengths it is made of. And it has to do with the semiconductor composition of the LED as well as the phosphorus coating and so on to produce this white light. You can also take a flashlight and cut a slit through it. And you can do this experiment yourself. Of course, diffraction mirrors are quite inexpensive to purchase. And there it is. You can see it's split into all the different lights. Now, if you shine a fixed wavelength at it, like a wavelength from a laser, here's a blue laser module, you can see. If I shine it under, it's going to split into many copies of itself. And the distance between those two dots is going to be determined by the separation of the lines on the diffraction mirror and different wavelengths are going to therefore separate by a different amount. So right away you can see how this can be used to measure wavelength. If I put a sensor on the other side where the white paper is, and I measure the distance between those two lines and I know all the dimensions, I can figure out exactly what is the wavelength that's coming in. This is a really popular method for measuring wavelengths. This particular diffraction mirror is 600 lines per millimeter. Now, people have used this in many different ways, not just instrumentation. In fact, there are some unusual kind of consumer products that use this to do some weird things. I happened to purchase one of those a while ago. So let me show you how they're using this particular structure to measure wavelength. And then we can see how various instruments do it. So let's take a look at this product over here. This is from a company called LightSquare. One of my friends bought this many years ago for us to analyze to see how it works. And I don't think this company really went anywhere. But the idea is that you would look at the light, let's say coming from a surface of a fruit, and then you would analyze that against some database and find out if that fruit is good or not, or what kind of composition it has, things like that. Uh, either way, the way it works is that it has its own internal light source. And then it emits some light out, looks at the reflection coming back through this lens over here, and then it measures what you know, color it is it's looking at. By generating its own light, it eliminates any ambient light effects and so on. But let's take a look inside of it and see how it works. So let's take a look and see what's inside of this. Now, I've already taken it apart. These two pieces simply sit on top of each other like this. So we can follow the optical path by looking at it from here. So we, there are two light sources inside of this. There's an incandescent light bulb. This is very good for creating near infrared and red colors. And there is a white LED here, better for creating green and blue and near ultraviolet light. This just exits this from a front lens. And then when it comes back, it goes through all the different structures that are here. So first thing it goes through is this lens over here that just focuses onto this lens. Then it goes through this long structure over here, which we'll take a look at. Another lens, a 45 degree angle mirror, and this camera sensor. This is nothing more than just a regular CMOS camera sensor that you would find in anything. It's very common. That's the nice thing about this design. It's using simple off-the-shelf components. There's nothing special about this sensor at all. This is, in fact, if you put a lens in front of it, you can take pictures with it. But what it happens is because of this structure over here, this is a diffraction film, I believe, is inside the middle of this. And that splits the wavelengths into different locations. So each different wavelength lands on a different part of this sensor. And by knowing that, you just simply dedicate whatever line of pixels that are to a certain wavelength, and that's how you measure the intensity of that wavelength. Like I said, a Fourier transform by landing different wavelengths on different locations. Now, this all happens in here. If you look at this, we should be able to see it. There you go. You can clearly see it split the wavelengths into different locations. Quite amazing. And it's fairly compact, you can see. It works, of course, in both directions. I believe there is a film inserted in the middle of this. I don't think this is based on a prism structure. Now, keep in mind that prisms will do the same thing, but in a very different, for a very different reason. Prisms are using refraction. This kind of films are using diffraction. Refraction is a function of dielectric material, or permittivity of materials, that, where the angle of light bends depending on the difference in the two materials it goes through. But diffraction is totally a different phenomenon, of course. So, but you can see the structure is quite straightforward. Now, the thing about this is that nothing moves in this structure. And because nothing moves, you need a big sensor. So you need a big sensor to measure all the different locations at the same time. But you can imagine if I only had a single photo detector and I had an ability of instead turning this, I could turn it such that at different angles it would land on the same phys physical photo detector. So if the photo detector was right over here, depending on the angle, I would be measuring a different wavelength. And if I know the angle, then I know what wavelength I'm measuring. That's the opposite of this. And we've seen that in some of the other videos in the past that I have done. But this is still not quite how a tunable laser, like the Santec one I repaired at the very beginning works. That one takes it a step even further to do this. So let's take a look at it. 
So here's the block diagram of the Santec TSL210. I think it's going to be very similar to the 200 model which we repaired earlier. I just couldn't find the block diagram for that particular one. So let's see what challenges we're dealing with here. So we want to have a single laser line coming out. We want it to have a very good line width and we want it to be tunable across a wide range of frequencies or wavelengths. Now they're, they're using a laser dial in the middle, but this is a fabri perot laser. Now we know that the fabri perot laser produces multiple lines. And those lines are a function of the cavity of the fabri perot laser itself. But of course we only want one of those, so we need to restrict the laser to laze only at one of those modes and then be able to move that around. Now the way they do this is very clever. They move the cavity of the laser to an external structure. And the way that works is on one side of the laser, there's an anti-reflection coating. On the other side, the laser comes out, goes through a lens, and it focuses it on a grating mirror. Now this grating mirror can be rotated, and as we know, depending on the angle of this grating mirror, only a particular wavelength will hit this mirror at the top. So let's say you're interested in, you know, 1550. You adjust this grating mirror such that at this incident angle, only the 1550 nanometer wavelength will be reflected to the mirror. And once it hits the mirror, then it comes back and goes back through the lens over here into the laser diode fabri perot itself, which means that only the modes that come back are now supported. So the laser, once it builds enough excitation inside of it, it begins to laze at only that wavelength, depending on the angle of this grating lens over here, which is quite amazing. I mean, it's a very straightforward idea, but of course it's quite difficult to build. And then by moving this grating mirror around, you change the lasing center of this fabri perot and then you produce the one line that you're looking for. There's of course an isolator and an optical attenuator and an angled APC connector if you want on the other side. There's a photo detector with a coupler so you can measure also exactly how much power is being produced. I think the TSL220 is even one step further and there is a wavelength meter, a separate wavelength meter also built into it. And using a piezo control, you can then do even finer control of the actual wavelength down to one picometer. So really quite amazing. So this structure is using the external cavity to accomplish this. And this is the kind of the ultimate way of doing it. There are still other ways, but you know, this video is going to go on forever if you go down that rabbit hole. Now I tried to open that instrument. It's almost impossible. It's just glued together in such a way that's very difficult to open. But I still want to show you one of these rotating grading mirrors, which are really cool to watch. So I got a hold of a broken wavelength meter which uses this structure similar to the wavelength that we've been using so far. So let's open that as, as the last thing and take a look at that too. All right, so here's a quick look inside this broken wavelength meter. We're gonna try and repair this in a separate video, but uh, nonetheless, we can take a look inside of it. So the fiber that enters over here is the wavelength of the light we're interested in measuring. It enters this big structure over here based on free space optics, which we will take a look at. There's obviously a sensor over here. You can see the signal from the sensor coming out. At the very top over here, behind this is a helium neon laser. This helium neon laser is the reference laser because this wavelength is so precisely known. It's a function of the atomic structure of helium, of course. So then as a result of that, you can always measure with respect to this. So every time you measure this as the disk rotates, you know exactly where you are. You're always making a relative measurement as opposed to an absolute measurement, which can drift over time. That's why we have a reference laser here. This is the ultimate way, of course, measuring something based on a non-solid state laser, of course. All right, let's take a look in here underneath this. Let me la remove this last screw here. Here we go. This should fall right off. There it is. And there is our rotating platform. And you know, oh, you know, I just realized this is not based on diffraction grading. This is based on Michelson interferometer. Uh, it's a totally different principle of operation yet again. I'd forgotten that this is how this was built. But we can describe the principle here fairly, fairly easily as well. There are actually mirrors on this, on the other side of this disk, I'll show you in a second. So the light that comes through over here bounces off of one of these mirrors and then bounces back. And since this is a coherent light, it self-interferes. And depending on the exact location and the distance of this mirror, different wavelengths will self-interfere at different locations. And then the sensor here will read it. Here's the laser coming in and bouncing off. And this is used as a reference, so that way you know exactly. So as this thing rotates at some location, the helium neon laser will self-interfere, and that will be the reference point. And everything after that is measured, of course, for the, all the other wavelengths. So yes, I'm sorry, this is not actually a grading mirror-based one. It's different, but nonetheless, it's cool to see. Let's turn it on. And here are the mirrors. You can see one of them right there is actually a dual mirror. 
which allows the light to reflect straight back so the light entering it will come exactly back out in the same way there it is there's two of them there you go you can see it rotates and it's perfectly balanced of course and we should be able to see it spin when i turn it on and here it is trying it's obviously not working properly it's constantly searching for the helium neon laser but i see no light coming from this laser at all so it's constantly trying to find it and it of course doesn't so something is wrong with it we're going to have to fix it in a different video but you can see how it would spin the mirror and how it would try to use the michelson interferometer to find the appropriate wavelength and check it out the laser came on after some time i think the laser might just be very old so it took a while for it to to come back and start lasing and the helium neon laser of course you can see it's bouncing all over the place and here's the thing if i block it you can see that it gets confused again and it starts to search for it when i let it go and as soon as it finds it again it's going to you know spin more periodically there it is so i hope you enjoyed this video as always i really like making tutorial videos they just take a very long time and this is a nice deviation from the typical rf stuff we talk about and of course engineering and science all of these branches are interesting i would love to hear from you in the comment section let me know what you thought about it and if any other topics you want me to cover as always thanks to the patreon supporters you make these things really possible as you can imagine these instruments are quite expensive and with your support i can produce more and more of them as always let me know your thoughts in the comment section I'll see you next time.